Praise everybody. Thank you. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guests are Kim Nguyen, the writer-director of the new film, The Hummingbird Project. And one of the film stars, Michael Mando, uh, in The Hummingbird Project, Jesse Eisenberg and Alexander Skarsgård play two hustlers attempting to strike it rich by building a fiber optic cable from Kansas to Jersey. Let's take a look. Everybody, please welcome from The Hummingbird Project, Michael Mando and writer-director Kim Nguyen. Let's hear it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Guys, thanks so much for being here. Uh, congratulations on this movie. It is never what I expected it to be right from the beginning, in the sense that when it starts, I imagine that I'm gonna get, which I kind of get as well, which is this tense, dense thriller about the stock exchange and about micro-trading, but really, not to be cliche, it's about the friends that we make along the way in a really beautiful way, and it sort of takes some of the denseness of the actual subject matter away from it. It's really smart really well crafted. I have to ask you as the writer of this, what was it like getting this thing down on the page? Because there are so many avenues and twists and turns that you could have gone down. When did you feel like you actually found it? Uh, when we uh, did the final mix, <laughs> really. I think that writing is a process that starts from the things that simmers in your head, but it ends. It really ends when you're, you're deciding to lock the picture. And uh, that moment is crucial. Sometimes you're locking it too late also. You're doing too many things. Uh, the one thing I do remember about the story is that uh, since things change so fast in, in is this industry, I didn't have time to consult with experts before locking the script. I had to kind of write black boxes. This does this and that, and then meet the experts when we went into production. What? How does, <laughs> yeah. that, how does that work? Well, I just read the basic principles. You know, I read articles and I talked to some people about how, you know, people would dig, would, were doing crazy things such as digging tunnels to go from, uh, to make thousands of miles of distances to gain like a single millisecond uh, edge off the, the stock market. But basically, I kind of ha had to go as if I was a contractor doing that tunnel. Okay, how do we go at it? So when I, when I was doing the script, I said, okay, these guys are going there. I did a little bit of research, did like a little road movie to see how, what, what the surroundings look like. But the very specific of what kind of machine does what and what, how do they dig the tunnel, I kind of had to you know, guess it. And How did that change while what you were gonna film and how you were gonna film? I mean, filming, no matter how locked the script is, becomes a compromise based off of daylight, based off of money, based off of schedule. But when you're going into it with blanks in the page, how does that work? Well, in, I'm taught, I said production, but it's pre-production, pre right? Okay, yeah, okay. it's pre-production, it's not production. You gave pre me a heart attack. No, no, that sorry, sorry, ahead. sorry. What was, what was cool about it, I think, is that I was doing this film as if I was the lead character, actually. I was like, okay, we gotta build this tunnel from there to there. What machines do we need to bring on set? And, you know, what permits do we need to do? And we kind of, like, filmed what you know the heartaches that we had to go through to get access as a as a filming company there's definitely a sense by the end of the film that this that this story is a kind of stand-in for the filmmaking process and the director whether it's intentional or not but it's very much about like the hard process that it takes to make a film even to the point where you have a character climbing a hill at the end to chop something down it feels like sisyphus eventually like a filmmaking process does but when it's all over even if it's a failure or if it's a success, there's a group of people who are like, God, we tried to do something together and we'll be tied together forever because of that. That's sort of, I mean, at the end of the movie, it's like, oh, this is someone making a movie about. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I totally relate to the lead character and also to, you know, doing a film and thinking, you know, you hope sometimes that when you, as an indie filmmaker that you're doing, making a difference and influencing people and, and bringing awareness to stuff. And then sometimes you get lost and you're like, okay, what's my purpose? Why am I like doing this as if my life depended on it? So it's really like the lead character. When did you find while you were writing it that it was going to be more about the relationships between the characters and sort of what they needed on an emotional basis rather than the sort of us versus them aspects with the villain as, or just sort of about, is it called micro trading? Mil uh, uh, high frequency trading. High frequency trading, yeah. excuse me. It was quite early on. I knew that uh, to make it to make it compelling, I, we needed to have that story between you know, two cousins. They were two brothers initially, but when we casted Jesse and Alexander, it didn't work as brothers. <laughs> so cousins worked perfectly. But uh, yeah, it was early on that I wanted to bring kind of, it's a, it's a question about our financial system, but also about uh, hopefully our, our purpose in life and why, you know, the American dream, I'm, I'm including the American dream as a Canadian, you know, as in North America, but uh, what, why are we so obsessed with the American dream and being successful and what does it mean and are we going 
are we aiming for something that's not exactly what we should aim for? You know, Michael, uh, I loved your performance in this movie. Uh, Thank you. I'm telling you this backstage. And one of the things that I love about your performance is that you have what I think is the hardest job as the actor, as an actor in the film. I think Alexander Skarsgård, while he's doing something completely different than we normally see, he's got like a big thing to kind of latch onto as an actor, as does Jesse. Your character is come almost the sort of straight man to all of their antics, yet you bring so much depth to the screen and all of the scenes that you're in. What is that like for you as an actor who has some, who's often had to play villains or had to play versions of villains to go in and just play a good guy? Oh, well, thank you so much for that. It was amazing. You know, I, I have to say, you know, I remember our very first meeting. Kim and I had a Skype meeting through our agency, CAA, and he offered me the role. And I remember, um, you know, having read the script and I had these ideas for the character. And to my surprise, Kim was so generous and so open and I said to myself, this can't be, you know, I think this guy is going to change his mind in a month or two. So I flew to Montreal and I met him again. And I ran the same things by him. And to my surprise, he was like, yeah, yeah, we talked about that. It's all good. And what I, what I realized with Kim is, what he, is he did that with all the actors. Mm. He was open to everybody's input. And he really permitted the actors to make it their own and to come in really feeling confident that they were, they had ownership of the character. And within that, he, I think, waved a really great web where you have performances, you know, the four major characters all are playing a variation of, you know, almost like in a different, they're coming at it from a different acting perspective. But the way Kim did it is that they all fit together so beautifully. It also individualizes the characters to a point where they feel like they have a lot of a, li a lot of life in them. They don't feel like they're just sort of cogs within the script. I mean, even Salma Hayek's performance and her lavish outfits are completely different than everybody else in in the movie. Uh, were those her ideas as as well? Yeah, I mean, uh, Salma comes from a from a high uh, high fashion background, and she's. She's tied with Gucci and all of that, so she was nine steps ahead of me for the look. She said, "Kim, I have some ideas," and she had the look. She had the ideas for her hair, even for her glasses, and it was very specific, very, very specific. And I was like, "Okay, let's let's go for it." I mean, she had her, she had she had consultants also she was working with. So yeah, her the, her look is completely her idea. Michael, is it a fear of yours as an actor? I mean, if I was an actor, it would be a fear of mine. It's like you talk to a director, you tell them your ideas of what you want to do, and the director is going to go, "Yeah, that sounds great," and as you said, they're going to get or they're going to say later on you're like uh, actually we're not going to do that or they're just not going to hire you now because you've opened yourself up in this way that they didn't partake they weren't they weren't interested in you know that's a, that's a really great question i think that's one of the biggest dilemmas about being an artist is that it requires so much out of you you know to to, to take on a role and to truly invest yourself is draining and you don't want to do it often too much because then you start losing the ability to go that deep but at the same time you don't want to go that deep and invest yourself in, a, in something that you don't believe in so that's a constant that with every project I think a lot of actor friends of mine have that sort of question in the back of their mind is like do I want to give my blood sweat and soul for this do, it, do I trust this director enough do I trust the story enough because you, I feel like you you don't want to do it too much or it, it dilutes. So it's, it's always, I think, a, to answer your question, it's always a question in the back of your mind is, is not only do I get the part, you know, because everybody w likes to work, but is do I want the part? And how often is, is your, your need for the part going to be a sacrifice for how much you can put into it or feel comfortable putting into it? I, I think I've had a very healthy relationship with it. I've never regretted not getting a part contrary to our relationship contrary yeah a horrible relationship I, I i still sometimes have nightmares about kim no i'm kidding he's awesome it was great what was great about that part too is we shot in the in the dead of winter in the middle of the forest in montreal which is where i was where it's, it's my hometown and it was great to have to you know leave montreal and i couldn't get a job like that for the life of me when i was there and then to come back five years later with a role like that but <clears throat> to answer your question, um, I think <clears throat> this is this this I'm talking directly to anybody who you know asks me about my career or acting advice or whatever it is. I can tell you that <clears throat> um, if you don't sacrifice your integrity artistically, it will be hard. You know, it'll be harder for you financially. It'll be harder for you 
um, maybe with your team and your management team, but I think on the long run, you, you benefit from it. So I don't, there's nothing that I regret, uh, thank God, that I've turned down or voiced my opinion and realized, you know, the director and I don't see eye to eye and I didn't get that part and it turned out to be a great part. There's never a regret because I know that I have to, you know, God gave me this body, this mind, and this heart, and I have to be true to it. You know, I was so, um, I, and I kind of already said this, but you are playing the straight man to these other two guys who are kind of eccentric and are having um, breakdowns sort of throughout the film. And it's a, it's a rarity that an actor can carry a scene like that, playing the straight man, can sort of, in a way, it feels like just sort of carry a scene on charisma alone. Oh, thank you. Well, it's not that you're going into a scene and that you have, you know, you have some moments where you have to yell and that you're really combative, yeah. but quite often it's left to the other actors in the scene and you're left there just kind of being a canvas for them in some way. And it is, it's very rare that, that uh, those actors get to shine, and you shine incredibly in those. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, not a question, just a, a, an ass-kissing compliment. Thank you so much, man. And I, and, and I, I want to add something to it. What, what I really resonated with the script is these guys were trying to accomplish something greater than themselves. You know, they, I, I really resonated with that because I think that's what we're all trying to do. You know, we all have a life and we're all going, you know, what's my life about? Like, how can I make my existence on this planet mean something? And what's so great is that, so that was a very heavy topic going into it. But what I loved about the script is that you come in thinking making half a billion dollars and beating the stock market was going to be your most important life mission. And by the end of the movie, the, the characters realize that the value of the soul is, is, um, has no number. You know, you're, there's no number on the value of your life, which kind of ties in the, the question about artistic integrity. And I think those, that, that's really what, what latched on, that, what I hung on to for the character. That's what grounded it. It's also not about the, I mean, as much as it starts off to be about the money, like you said, about halfway through, it becomes about doing something doing something greater than yourself even though that thing is still about making money they've completely lost track of that and they're just looking to accomplish a major goal or the, the egyptians you know they had this amazing thing and um i'm so fascinated by that you know the ancient cultures where they said when you die they weigh your heart and they weigh it against the a, a feather and that's really what decides if you go into the F, that decides your, your whole life, is how heavy is your heart compared to a feather. And in, I think these characters are, start off with a really, really heavy heart. And hopefully by the end, they, they, um, I don't want to spoil it too much. But so wait, the Egyptians better. wanted the heart to be as heavy as the feather, not heavier than the feather? The idea is, you, is, is to die with a light heart. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? To die, <laughs> to die without this obsession of numbers. And, I mean, we were shooting, and we were talking about high-frequency trading, Jesse and I. Kim would yell, action, right? We'd start going, you know, well, how many milliseconds? And, da, 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 and we're, we're pissed off and we're angry and our heart rates are going fast. And then you'd hear, cut. And it'll be just us. And you'd hear, the wind in the trees. You'd hear the, the ice in the river. And nature didn't give a shit yeah. <laughs> about what we were talking about. And you realize, like, man, this is kind of absurd, you know, that that's what we care about. Um, Kim, can you talk about working with uh, Alexander Skarsgård? One of the things that I loved about his performance is that there is the ability to go over the top with this, to lean on mannerisms, to lean on someone who is maybe on the spectrum and is only deals with numbers, but you don't have him do that at all. It's a much more subtle performance than I think a lot of actors would, would lend to something like that. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, uh, as Michael mentioned, I welcome talking with the actors, and one of my the most fascinating and exciting moments when I do a film is actually when we rent out a restaurant or a hotel room with a big table, have some wine, have some food, and I have three or four of my lead actors read the script and just look at them, and I just stare at them and take a couple of snapshots, and so much is revealed of who the characters should be, and there's a lot of transformation. And it was the case for uh, Jesse and Alex. The one thing that came about when they saw them together is, okay, do I acknowledge the difference of heights or do I like kind of hide it? And I asked him, are you okay if I acknowledge it? And he said, yeah, that's great. So we decided to have this kind of, of mice and men relationship with the two guys. So where you have Alexander hovering over him. 
And because, well, you know, Alexander is a little bit of a pretty guy. He's pretty good looking, you know. So <laughs> he doesn't mind being, trans I think he doesn't mind transforming himself. He's con completely secure with who he is. And he ro really wanted to go there. So um, we knew that he needed a, he wanted a, a nasty pale green robe when he's in the hotel and wanted to uh, dance to hip hop when he gets like a really successful um, uh, beat. But... Uh, yeah, uh, his hair also, I had sent him a, a picture of of, the, uh, of what I imagined. I saw something of a, a trader in front of a screen, and he said, yeah, I love that. That's what we're going. But then the uh, some investors of the film, when I told them, I gave them, I sent them the picture, which kind of looked like this. They said, what are you doing to our Alexander? This is <laughs> this represents half of our investment. Are you mad? Uh, so uh, I kind of like, uh, so then Alex, do you mind going like a little bit less? Maybe he, you know, and he said, no, Kim, I'm going to support your vision. I know your first vision was what you told me, and somebody told you something, so no, we're going where you told me to go, and that's where we're doing. So when he came on set, he ran to uh, wardrobe and had his hair shaven as soon as he came. <laughs> it was and, more than shaved. Yeah. I, I, saw him, I saw them. We were sitting in the honey wagon, which is where they do the makeup, and I saw Alex in the corner of my eye. He was over there, and they were plucking yeah. his hair. <laughs> and he was, was really having painful. his oatmeal and listening to music very comfortable. Yeah. No, I thought well, it was maybe a Swedish told, thing, you yeah. know? <laughs> <laughs> because it was like very clown-like, the cut. So it, I said, well, it doesn't look real. It doesn't look like natural. So he said, I said, we could have like a small wig around or, ha or pluck it. And he said, oh, I don't want a wig. So <laughs> they plucked like hundreds of hairs. For, like, it lasted like 16 hours. And he was really painful. He was almost crying at the end. But he said, no, no, I want to do it. But in the end, we right, had a wig That's where you brought also. in more wine? Exactly, yeah. exactly. In the end, we had a wig also. That's so interesting that the, uh, and I, not to knock your, the financiers or anything, but that they would think that having him change his look would affect the ability to market the film. I mean, his name is still on the poster. Yeah. That's still clearly Alexander Skarsgård. But now you've also got, for lack of a better word, a gimmick of him changing his whole look. Yeah, that I seems agree. like a greater marketing tool than just him looking as pretty as he does on something and something else. I, I think in the end, everybody really went like, like the idea. I think that they, they were worried that like his look, his transformation would make him look sleazy, but he looks like a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm curious, you said that you get the actors together uh, in a hotel room and you guys read the script over and things change. Do you go back and rewrite after that? Substantially, substantially. Usually, I, I have little, little touch-ups, you know, not rewrite the old scenes, but I touch, touch up the dialogues almost like 20 to 30% of the script. There's like each scene I'm going to have like a little tweak. Um, oh, so just tweaking the dialogue here yeah, and there, maybe yeah, adding mannerisms yeah, or, thing, or exactly. ideas of theirs? Yeah, I kind of like exploit this process because being a French-Canadian, I've, ex I've been exposed to American culture, but from television. So I do get a sense of dialogue, of contemporary dialogue. I couldn't do, you know, old English or whatever. But then Jesse, especially in this case, Jesse being of a, um, uh, he's a second generation of East Euro uh, European immigrants, right. and he's so New York. He's like, he could tell me this, 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 maybe I don't feel it. And um, it really helped a lot. And in the case of Salma, we decided also to acknowledge her background and her heritage. So we really, I did tweak the lines afterwards as well because she, initially she was, the character wasn't necessarily a person from Latin America. How much did you find that the film changed? Because you said it's changing up until you picture lock, basically. How much did you find things change from your script while, while you were editing? Because this is one of those types of movies where you can, you are juxtaposing multiple storylines and you could find yourself being like, oh shit, this one has to go towards the end rather than in the beginning. Totally. I mean, for for films like this, the I, th I think the genre is kind of tragic comic, tragic comedy or something, uh, and it's the most nerve wracking uh, tone that you can have for a film because you want you want the humor to f to feed the drama and the drama to feed the the, the humor, That's but it you can go the opposite. You, you know? do something that I really like in this film. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. I'm going to interrupt with a compliment though. So, uh, okay. which is that oftentimes with tragic comedies or dramedies, the jokes feel like they are from outside the world of the movie and that they solely exist to sort of um, alleviate the tension of the drama. Whereas one of the things that I liked about your film was that it, the jokes never feel like they are self-referential or in some way just attempting to do that. They are actually very much a part of the world. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so just to conclude, I guess, uh, yeah, that's, that was uh, the, 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 the final cut was basically the most challenging thing is that I usually 
over conclude stuff on the script to make sure that each of the storylines of my characters have a conclusion in case we don't because sometimes you don't know where you, who needs a conclusion and who you can try, kind of guess where he's heading reading a movie is a completely different thing than watching it exactly you can accomplish you don't know. so much more conclusion in tone and in a look totally you know? totally so i think it's important in scripts to kind of overwrite the endings and investors and people who kind of like that also you know just want to make sure okay We've, you know, we solved every single math issue that there is. But then in editing, I find that even you have three or four or five characters that need their conclusion, you kind of want to edit it as if it's one. And you almost, in a way, let's say there's three acts to the conclusion, and you kind of like give one beat to, to the other character, then switch to the other character as if it was one single thing. But you can guess, guess in between that the other guy did what this guy on screen just did. You understand what I mean? Yes, <laughs> I think so, yeah. So you, you kind of want to make it feel like one ending, basically. Right. Uh, I think we have some time for uh, questions from the audience. We have a couple questions. Hey, right here. Hi. 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 I'm really excited to see this movie, and I wanted to know what is like both of you guys' most favorite scene to shoot in the movie, or the one you're like most proud of, or really excited for the audience to see. <coughs> the scene that was most um, mean meaningful. <laughs> the chainsaw scene was was really fun. Oh, it, it was really fun, but the one that had the most meaning for me was in the Towards the end, when the journey is over, I don't want to give up too much, but there's an ambulance. We're in an ambulance and we're going to the hospital. What, what I loved about that scene is I think we sort of more or less shot it chronologically, and that was towards the end. And we had done the chainsaw scene before that. And what was great is we were shedding the character. We were shedding the role. But the character was also shedding the monkey on its back, you know, the... the um, that heavy heart that we talked about earlier. And it really had that sense for me where I was like, man, thank God this is over because we live in a society where we're, we, we, post, we post a photo on our social media, right? We post it, we put our phone down, and then five seconds later we check our phone to see if anybody liked it. Then we put it away and then an hour later we check again. And again, and again, and again. We live at, at such unnatural speeds, you know. We're in the middle of the night, and here we are. We turn on our phone, and we're looking at, at you know, blue light that's affecting our sleep. So that, that to me, all came into, um, all solidified at the end of the movie, where I was like, man, we need to slow down, because these rhythms don't lead to anything healthy. And I felt that in the ambulance, and there was a huge sense of, like, we don't need to go that fast. It doesn't make our lives better. Uh, I think I have time for one more. Also, I agree with that. I feel like I spend most of my time trying to slow my brain down. We really don't. You know, just unplug and chill, dude. You're going to get more done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're going to get more done. Hi, so my question's for Kim. Um, I was just wondering, um, you wrote this amazing script, and I was curious if you ever, ever entertained the idea that someone else would direct. Uh... Yes, it, in, uh, as in her. <laughs> I uh, yes, ab absolutely, and uh, and the opposite also. Um, it's it's hard to get the director to to like your script to a level that he's going to commit to it to three or three years. And I think that I'll, uh, when I was working on the French side, uh, I, it was kind of like I started doing writing and script and, and directing. And I think that there's so much competition between directors and such amazing directors in the U.S. that. It sort of became like a secret weapon. I decided to work at the English language, which I thought, I assumed in Montreal that I was like I was good at writing English. I sucked at it. I worked substantially. Well, you're great, man. <laughs> you wrote a great script. I, but I hired a lot of consultants and proofreader and proofers to, and it's, it's, it was like a seven or eight year process. But yes, if there's a director that would that likes my script. For this script, it was a seven or eight year process, or no? Uh, no, just writing just in, in English, general, in just English. generally writing in English. But I think it was a, like a four or five year process, uh, you know, from the idea that matures in your head to to a final script, yeah. So yes, when, absolutely. When do you start writing? When, when, like, do you get an idea and then start writing, or do you kind of like let it percolate for a long time until you feel like it's close to a full, uh, fully baked script? I usually have the ideas in mind while I'm doing another film, and you know, I for some reason now I have a, I talk to a lot about it to my production designer for some reason. I don't know because it kind of like. You want to materialize the you idea? You looked at maybe? me when you said that. Do, am I your production uh, yes, designer? Yes, you're my production <laughs> designer. But uh, yeah, there's something about production design that kind of 
yeah, you know, brings an idea, an idea to to like something that's physical or something. But and but I, what I know I do is I do a lot of drafts. I write a first draft very quickly. I try to do it within like six weeks or something. Is that with an outline or just from beginning um, to end figuring it out. I, d I do less outlines than I used to be to do because I know that basically the outline is the first draft, and there's usually. 10 to 15 rewrites afterwards. And the, the scariest thing is losing yourself, but you kind of got to accept it. That when you've lost yourself and you're getting less good grades from you know poorer grades, you feel, okay, now it's time to read the first draft back mm -hmm. and kind of like almost grapple the stuff that works, but stick it to that first flow that you've, that you've achieved in the first uh, or second draft, maybe. Yeah, do you find that there is a, uh, I guess you kind of said this, but w you know, when you rewrite and you rewrite, oftentimes you can dilute the energy and the sort of, uh, it, sometimes just an anger that comes out of the first draft. Totally, totally. There's something about overexposition. Yeah. Everybody reads the script and tells you, well, maybe, blah, 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 maybe. And the, mis the mystery of your character sometimes is what makes you want to go on. And uh, it's just happened recently. So it's like I've, I've done like there was a second draft that really was felt people were compelled by, by the story. And then by, I got the 10th draft and like, well, I don't know. Like there's this guy who has, he's, he was too real in a way, too like down to earth or something instead of just keeping the mystery. <clears throat> I have a question for you. Do you how how much do you uh, plan before you actually sit down on that first page? How much do you break down your story and figure out the arcs of the characters and all that before you actually start writing the story? Uh, I used to do them. I do a lot of preparation, but now it's more kind of a. Um, it's pretentious, but it's a little bit of second nature because the, the story arcs completely change. It's almost like quantum physics, I feel, with screenwriting. The, the possibilities are so endless that you have a sense of the three acts. I do, I do kind of have a figure out a, a three act structure in my head, knowing that it's going to transform as I write the story. So every, every you time don't, there's. You don't plan it too no, much. No, not before. that much. Oh, not really? that much. And now I believe strongly in writing the first 25 or 30 pages, mm -hmm. then reading yourself back, then seeing, okay. How does this affect what I had in mind for the next? You've uh, also 70 done pages. it for so long that you you've you've done the planning for so long. Yeah, that, I've done a couple of scripts in your before. System. Uh, well, hopefully. <laughs> no, because I mean, I mean, I'm saying for like you know younger writers, you know, a lot of I hear a lot of people who are very experienced start start developing where they can just jump in, right. but what a lot of younger writers don't realize is that people like Kim have been doing that work for you know a decade where they were breaking it, breaking it, breaking it. Where I, I guess maybe yeah, they can take I, I that think uh, yeah. you know you know S you know Sid Field is is still a great tool to to start with you know I think you got to start there but just it's better to think that it's not a dogma and I think that Joseph Campbell and and the other writer who who interpreted Joseph Campbell for screenwriting sorry I forget the name is that McGee uh, the journey Joseph Campbell the hero's journey uh, yeah, yeah hero's journey but the interpreter and he wrote of him the is writers that Robert hero. McKee is that no I don't maybe, think so. maybe. that story he wrote that yeah. story that Charlie Kaufman yeah, but yeah. I think it might be the same writer. I'm oh, not okay. sure. I don't know. Whatever. I'm not sure. <laughs> I just I just got to give one last story. It's going to be one minute. We were Please. going on a river, and it was minus 10 Celsius is how many? It was freezing. Fahrenheit? Oh, I don't know. It was how freezing. How many can somebody, does somebody know? Anyways, it was... Your, 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 the, the lashes on your eyes would freeze. It was It was 10 degrees <laughs> below freezing, and it wasn't supposed to be that. It was supposed to be, you know, spring, uh, autumn weather. So we had planned for a raft with the camera gear and our, our crew on the river floating. Everything was validated. We had a uh, security crew. But then as it got freezing, there's one thing is that you have 20 seconds of autonomy before literally dying, you know, risk of death if you fall in the water. So within 24 hours, we had to double the security and people really like looking at us, you know. But then... And double the salary. Double the right. salary, exactly. <laughs> but then as the water started rolling on top of the raft, it was freezing. So there's like you know, one eighth of a, an inch of water that freezes, then another inch. So you got three, four tons of weight, ec of extra weight on the raft. So they start sinking, but it, you get 20 seconds. And, but we keep filming, we're like, kind of like, no, this is how, how we lo lose like sense of priorities in film. Right. We keep filming because we think, no, we got to do this. We got to get it, we got to get yeah, it. Yeah, we got to get it. But people are slipping on ice on the raft and it's like, it's super risky and like water keeps hovering. So that was a scary moment, but uh, we got the scene at the end of the day.
Yeah, it's it's Jesse climbing no up the died, mountain with the chainsaw, which is a right? bonus. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well um, guys, uh, congratulations on the film. I love it. Uh, it comes out this week. People can see it, right? Yes, uh, this uh, this Friday in theaters all over uh, in New York and in LA, and next week uh, next week it's going to be all over the U.S. Well, I can't wait to see uh, as well what you Thank guys you. do next. Thanks so much Thank for being here. Much. Give them Thank a huge round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.